Hello, everyone, and welcome to the September edition of the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. My name is Jess Roman, and I'm here today with Cesato Ito and Tobias Kurt. Uh, we are also joined by Renee Bernard, and we will have Renee joining us for the Q&A portion of the talk. Uh, so please do stick around. I think it's a very interesting topic. Before I introduce our speaker today, I would like to tell you a few things about our upcoming events at the BEMC. So we have actually two BEMC talks this month. The next one is September 21st. That's a Wednesday. It will be a hybrid event, uh, both in person at the Charité and online. And it's a causal perspective on the age education correction and cognitive screening test by Marco Piccinini. And then we have an October BEMC as well, which will be held only online. We have a guest uh, from the US, Daniel Westreich, who will be giving a talk uh, October 5th on beyond internal validity, field notes from the methodological borderlands. You can find all of that information and the sign up on our website, bemcolloquium.com. And I'll also teaser that we are setting up our new series of journal clubs. We've actually picked all of the papers now and have all of our journal club hosts. And uh, that will run the third Wednesday of the month, the next session from October to February. So we'll send an email about that in the very near future, but you can already mark your calendars for another exciting semester of the Journal Club. So all are welcome to join us for that. Any other announcements? Uh, no. Excellent. Then we can get started. So I'll introduce today's speaker. We're very happy to have Rene Bernard with us to uh, present his work. I think it's incredibly valuable. Uh, the talk is called Empty Your Research Data File Drawer with Fiddle. And Renee is working as the coordinator for value and open science at the NeuroCure Center at the Charité and BIH here in Berlin. Um, but I always like to ask our speakers a little bit about how they got to doing what they're doing and maybe what it has to do with epidemiology and medical research. So in the case of Renee, he started out as a pharmacist, becoming then a pharmacologist, neuroscientist, neuroanatomist, behavioral neuropharmacologist, quality management developer, and finally an open science advocate. So it sounds like he may be eligible by retirement uh, at this stage, but actually he's still far from it. And we're very grateful um, that he's working on these cool initiatives. He's also quite active on Twitter. You can see his handle there. And I will let him tell you about the rest and importantly, this very cool tool. And again, stick around for the Q&A. If you have questions though during the talk that come up, you can already put them in to uh, this Q&A using the Q&A button here on Zoom. And we'll be sure to bring those around in the uh, interactive round. Okay, thanks a lot. And we'll see you at the end of the talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rene Bernard. Um, I am affiliated with the uh, Excellence Cluster NeuroCure, and I'm also um, part of the BIH Quest team. And today I'm presenting uh, at the Berlin Epidemiology and Methods uh, uh, Colloquium. Um, my presentation, Empty Your Research Data File Draw with Fiddle. But before we go into uh, what a file drawer is, or even what Fiddle is, um, I want to talk about the subject behind this and what got me excited about it, uh, which is research waste. So we all know, uh, have heard about research waste, and um, basically you can sort it in two different uh, categories. So it's research basically without a public record. It's something that never saw the light of day that was uh, created in a laboratory and uh, was never even presented as an abstract somewhere. So we don't even know about it, we can't find it. And second, and this is what funders become more and more aware and want to change, is that research, I would say, that cannot be built on. So uh, where you do not have a certain kind of data availability, again, these do not need to be open data, but somewhere where you know, okay, somebody has the, the actual records of the data, they are easily to share uh, in, in, in a fair manner, 
And um, if that is not there, um, then we know what happens uh, after a publication. They just run on these uh, data files and get eventually uh, dumped after uh, 10 years. And um, this is especially sad if you consider uh, um, these are just not naked data, but uh, all the resources that went into this. So somebody applied for funding to do a certain type of research. Uh, may even produce preliminary data to support the application. Um, then received actual funding, which as we know is most of the time taxpayers' money, um, employed uh, uh, personnel for study execution, for uh, evaluation and analysis, um, maybe lives of animals had to be sacrificed or the health of patients were affected by such a study. And in some cases, even a manuscript were produced um, that you know, got rejected a couple times and eventually let go. Um, it is especially sad if you look at the, the literature and, and, and there's a publication that estimates that 85% of all the money invested in biomedical research is wasted. And um, there are some people that argue this, that this waste is, is a necessary byproduct. So uh, that uh, um, you have to produce uh, enough hypotheses and uh, enough studies and then eventually uh, um, research comes out that really brings a field further that are these, these, these brilliant uh, papers that we all know about and um, that make the, uh, the wheels turn. And the rest is just, hmm, yeah, uh, not so great and we have to uh, live with this. And uh, uh, what I want to show you with uh, today's presentation is that in this waste is actually real value uh, that we need to uh, lift. It needs to come to the surface uh, because not lifting this treasure that sits in the trash is uh, a real waste and has sometimes detrimental effects. On the other hand, we already know, and we just need to look at the statistics here, is that uh, the number of publications is really on the rise in an unstoppable rate. Um, so this raises the question is, uh, do we really need more publications? Or is it not necessary to really push out part of this waste? Uh, because uh, uh, it really would pollute uh, uh, the literature. And um, you can look at several statistics, so uh, there are estimates of papers that are probably never read. But uh, some of the uh, estim investigations show for across disciplines that uh, minus self citations, about 18% of papers are actually never ever cited. So um, clearly there is already research out there that uh, um, is accessible but uh, not of interest or basically there's so much literature out there that we cannot keep, keep up with this. And now we also have uh, the rise in, in preprints and um, again these are just examples uh, on the right for instance from the field of nephrology you see uh, the um, exponential uh, uh, rise uh, that has not even halted in 2020 and continued further. And um, you see that also about half of the preprints uh, on bioarchive eventually end up in, in journals. On the other hand, the um, COVID-19 crisis and um, the, uh, probably saw benefits from the preprints uh, uh, that were shared. So research was accelerated, but uh, there was also a big quality concerns about these uh, preprints. So these were really not uh, up to the best standards. And that's also uh, um, a result that we have to live and somehow also address. So um, there's good and bad, and um, we have to sort of find a, really a, a middle ground here. Um, at, at the same, on the other hand, uh, uh, we have a recurring pattern uh, for research that seems to be hard to publish or almost unpublishable. And uh, this is what we then attribute uh, uh, to the terms publication bias. 
Um, this has to do with several parties that have different um, yeah, insights or perceptions um, uh, in the publication process. So these are authors uh, that, of course, would like to uh, publish, have their study easily published and uh, sometimes, uh, um, yeah, make it a little look a little nicer than it actually was. Um, we get back to this a little later. We have reviewers that uh, want to make sure that they do a good job and really keep what they consider junk or bad research out of it. And you have editors that um, want to make sure that the, um, the publications are, um, um, that appear are exciting or are novel and, keep the, uh, and also are uh, citable in the future. So out of this, you can see a clear pattern for uh, that um, looking for statistical significance is one of the, the most important things that, uh, that uh, reviewers and, and editors look for. And therefore, it's, it's a factor whether uh, a study is publishable or not these days. Um, also, uh, prior publications on this field. So um, if there is an, an accepted effect in a field that is not found in a current study, this could be also a red flag uh, right there. Um, the same is true for small effect sizes. Uh, they um, go along with less confidence in the results and also in the study design, uh, especially when prior data exists. Uh, also, small underpowered versus large and um, high-powered studies. Uh, you tend to believe more what high-powered studies says, and um, this can be true, but uh, again, it's, it needs to have a closer look. And uh, data with a certain degree of variance, uh, some noisiness are also not really uh, liked and to do not tell a clear story. So, and if we look at the, the literature, we, we are all conditioned to, to look at these positive and statistically significant results and publications with one or two stars uh, that agree with prior, prior findings. And uh, so data that have a reasonable effect, and then we consider them a true and nice finding. And uh, um, then we have the impression, well, this is what, what we find in literature. This is what it's, it's all about. This is a really good study. Study. But uh, these days, as a and also before, as a published author, uh, as I said before, you 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 have to have certain skill sets to 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 land such a success as a publication. And everybody who publishes for the first time uh, knows how it feels once you get a bloody nose, even through a desk rejection. Uh, even though you put so much effort into this and you did your best job in research and somebody tells you that it's not, not publishable in their, in their journal. And uh, um, so you have to even learn the, the name of the game to be a successful re researcher. So to get published in so-called high-ranking uh, journals uh, or high-impact journals, there are even trainings for these uh, you can find. You have to also pay for these. And uh, because then, uh, again, once you land of these, one of these high impact publications, it's usually an indicator for, for future success. So you can use this to support uh, your own grant application for which you get to more, more research and then you receive funding to again, try to publish again in, in similar um, high impact journals that have great visibility and so this the cycle basically continues and, and keeps the research and the money flowing. Um, so what is interesting about this, this your, these publications is um, you never have to really reveal the order of the experiments. So when you do a storytelling, you can just put it together for a nice story. Um, you don't have to reveal whether data were produced in batches or uh, were then combined later whether you actually had a different hypothesis and then switch the outcome. And if there are some data in your study that would contradict or uh, uh, invalidate your, your previous data, you just don't need to say anything about them. And as we know, you, in, in future directions, you can write almost anything. There's no need to, to follow up on these. And um, what is also happening is not everyone is sort of especially talented uh, to, to tell these stories. 
especially if if the and it's especially hard if the results are not clear and the story is is, is complicated and that is true with uh, so-called uh, null results so um, i find this term better than negative results um because uh, um um, they still have a, a value so these are not negative is such a term that uh, uh, um, yeah that's already condescending to to the research so non results is, is better because uh, the results the, the, the interpretation is not clear and uh, um, so uh, and again these results are, are hard to to communicate if you have some contradictions in your data set and uh, in the preclinic, it's, it's the case that often reviewers say this, well, it was a bad study design if you receive data that are inconclusive. And uh, uh, um, it takes large efforts really to, to publish such a thing with many revisions, rejections, sometimes even years. And uh, uh, because publishers know that uh, these studies uh, receive less attention there, they are not going to be cited uh, enough. So um, I think they let a few of them through. But uh, again, nobody wants to have too many negative or null results in their in, in their journal. So they, they keep them out. And they also provide little value for grant supports. So on the right side, you can see how this is happening. You know, what, what happens if you uh, uh, do not uh, publish uh, certain studies. So, and at first, if you look at the, the first uh, uh, overview, you see that there's roughly the, the, the same number of positive trials than negative trials. But already with the study publication bias, you see a, a large number, more than half, basically disappearing from uh, uh, the, the literature. Um, if you then add on some outcome reporting bias, so where you, uh, for instance, then highlight other uh, results or do even outcome switching, uh, you turn some of these negative data into uh, um, uh, positive trials. And even for some negative trials, you can sometimes, with some spinning, even get some uh, positivity out of it and um, sell them actually for more than what it's worth or, or hide basically the the negative uh, uh, results in there which then in the end leads to uh, the citation bias that uh, positive trials will be much more reported uh, in, in the literature and much more cited than anything that is uh, um, has a spin or is negative. And so if you compare this really to, to the first uh, um, picture, uh, you see clear um, a swap of, 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 of the outcome here and the, the, the story is totally reversed. And um, this can have a detrimental effects. Um, so this is uh, um, a, a true story uh, that happened basically in the 80s uh, with uh, an antiarrhythmic drug called uh, lorcanonide, and um, that uh, uh, several trials were conducted and won by, by Cowley and colleagues. Uh, very easy design, 50-50 um, design in, in 50 uh, people in the placebo group, 50 in the drug group. And, um, you know, after the study ended and um, you could find that uh, um, nine patients in the drug group uh, died versus just one uh, a person in the placebo group. And... Um, so you you see sort of like from their from their quotes when they said that they were they really tried to publish these results and they were young full of enthusiasm they started on the top of the Lancet and then um, tried two or three cardiology journals and you know got in, an immediate uh, rejection and again if you have too many rejections as you know you just move on to to other projects and. Um, so what happened that uh, uh, ultimately in the, uh, I think in the late 80s, uh, uh, the drug was pulled off the market, more for marketing reasons than, than anything else. And uh, what they report then in a coffee break in 93, somebody remembered that old study 
and uh, um, was also at the time where uh, the term publication bias and more the critical discussion of, of um, outcome reporting uh, be- came to light. And so they felt they had an actual moral duty uh, to try again. And uh, again, they found that the high impact journals were not interested. And, um, and that, that final sentence is, is something that is really uh, uh, something that uh, um, is surprising, but uh, um, typical in that story is that they added the words publication bias, as you can see here also in the inset to the title, an example of publication bias. And uh, probably this uh, um, led uh, to a different uh, view of, of the manuscript. And so finally, the, um, the, it got published. And it was then that, uh, that other um, healthcare professionals realized if we had known this sort of like when by the time uh, the study was actually completed, which was like 13 years uh, later, um, and extrapolate this um, to the uh, number of people that have received the drug in that time, uh, it is estimated that about 100,000 deaths uh, uh, could have been prevented. Again, this is just uh, probably a ex- little bit of an exaggeration and um, the theoretical number. So, but you probably all know more more about this. But um, again, it it illustrates really that uh, uh, negative data uh, um, need to be reported. So, and um, especially um, if it involves humans, and um, the, if they escape uh, the literature, it can have detrimental effects. Um, an, another uh, story is uh, how these uh, publication bias or uh, can come about uh, is due to the um, science system itself. So um, it's what I call the science uh, uh, career traveler. So we all know that uh, um, to be successful, um, it is um, yeah, almost required that you uh, do your certain degrees uh, or career stations at different uh, laboratories in different universities, sometimes also different countries. And um, you can say, I mean, from my experience, is that at every station you actually produce more data um, and analyze them than you can publish. And uh, you do this sometimes to the, to your last day, and then you move on to your next uh, career step, and you say, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm going to publish these sort of like when I have the time." And uh, uh, um, sometimes we do this. Maybe we do one paper more, but you know, you get actually paid at the time for doing different stuff. So uh, many things really then uh, fall uh, off and. Um, um, in reality, then these data that are not even ours because actually belong to the institution where they were generated, they accumulate on these electronic data carriers and eventually we carry them on maybe as backups uh, our entire uh, scientific career. And this is uh, what we then call the, the, the file drawer you know, that uh, accumulates you know, over time and the older you are, the, the more you actually have in there when you look uh, um, after um, you're a senior scientist, it's, it's quite, quite large. And um, yeah, this brings me to a topic. It's really that I have to confess, you know, I'm not the youngest researcher anymore either. And um, that is something um, that I haven't really told before, but it's, it's one of the motivators. Uh, for actually getting into the subject of publication bias, because as you can imagine, I have my own publication bias. And that relates to a study um, that uh, you see here that is actually published and uh, it's really well cited and really well received. But it still always uh, nags me that uh, an important part of the data set is actually missing in there. So um, to recapitulate, some of the, you know that uh, there is such a thing as the monoamine uh, um, 
um, uh, hypothesis in, in depression, so that uh, um, um, depression occurs when there are too few uh, monoamines like no adrenaline or dopamine or serotonin uh, present in, in your cortex and other parts of uh, the brain. So in this study, we looked at transcript expression in the locus aurelius, which um, produces uh, no adrenaline in the brain. And so we expected uh, to see large alterations there uh, and on a transcript level. But what we found was really not a big difference. So uh, also looking at, at bipolar depression and uh, that, that, that really puzzled us uh, 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 that we could not uh, find this. Of course, the numbers were, patients were not really big, but uh, we then went on and sort of like, okay, what else has changed? And we found sort of a compelling story that uh, uh, relates to glutamate signaling, to glia, to growth factors, uh, things that were already starting to uh, be reported in the literature. And uh, when it then came to publishing, we had to make a decision. And again, senior authors weighed in heavily on it and said like, mm, you know, these results, these negative results, we don't really know what's behind them. So uh, you want to tell a clear story. You don't want to raise questions. Uh, and um, we, uh, we should not put these in. Uh, the other reason is also uh, you have to also consider the word limit. The more data you put in, uh, the more you have to discuss them. And also it raises more questions with uh, um, reviewers. So, and to this day, really these data exist just as a Society for Neuroscience poster. Um, and I wonder how many people sort of like have looked into to these uh, uh, transcripts in a, in, a, in a similar set or uh, um, in, in animal models and uh, yeah, don't know or would like to know uh, about it. And um, so it always fills me with, with remorse uh, that I, I didn't have the guts to say like, no, these data go in there and or, um, because, I mean, if you see how much th this is cited, people would really know about it and the story would have got out. And so it's unfortunately uh, uh, forgotten. And uh, uh, negative data, you know, uh, uh, are important also to, to keep a field uh, on track for, to be open for, for different directions. And you see this in, in the recent discussion about the, the fabricated data, uh, an Alzheimer's article. Um, and uh, um, so it, it is not good, you know, for a field sort of like to, to be settled on something because you need also uh, um, the counter sites, you know, where there's a uh, finding uh, with a similar setup, you can find also the opposite, sometimes no finding and you, this, uh, this yin yang really uh, is, is necessary and it's real and uh, often not displayed in the literature. And uh, uh, um, when you create then a, a setting where you have a field that is so narrow and then that doesn't allow um, alternative hypotheses to be published or uh, uh, dogmas to be uh, um, yeah, caught somehow or challenged, um, then uh, things like this can happen. Uh, whether these were fabricated or not doesn't really play a role anymore. But uh, if science have more reasons really to leave those results off the shelf, then spending the time uh, um, to write these papers up, then there's something really, really wrong. And um, you, you, uh, um, you even find reports of what's called an amyloid mafia that, that bullied other researchers uh, and, and they were just doing their job to be critical. And, and I think that's the, 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 the main message is that we always, no matter where we are, should keep an open mind and uh, then, as I said, embrace uh, a negative data. Uh, last but not least, um, yeah, there's also the open science community of which I'm part of. Um, and they might have, again, other reasons, but uh, uh, this is not just in 2016, because I was just at an open science uh, festival in Hannover, where this was repeated. So that um, 
the uh, big leaders in the field really demand fewer publications and therefore better science. And it makes sense because uh, currently uh, journal publication is practically our only measure of productivity and career promotion. And their emphasis is basically to say like we need to look at alternative uh, uh, matrices here and not just publication. And when it comes to publication, they just need to be better and uh, uh, not just these least publisher units that we have and um, um, have uh, this, this still contributing to this rapid growth of papers. Um, and with this, from my point of view, it hurts also a little bit because now again, reviewers or editors could have uh, a leverage against these uh, um, publications that have negative data in there and said like, well, remember, we need fewer numbers of papers. And um, so let's go back once you have uh, better data to be published. So all this discussion uh, also happened uh, at the Quest Center, uh, especially in 2017, um, when this topic of publication bias uh, was brought up, brought up about, and uh, we were wondering what what can be done about it. So, and uh, especially uh, with these unpublished data that are filling up file drawers. So we thought like, hmm, what can be done sort of like to uh, empty these file drawers because that's sad. Uh, how can we help uh, researchers? Uh, and um, so at first uh, we said like, well, you know what? Uh, um, if you can't really publish this in traditional journals, there are journals that publish also negative data. And so the discussion went on. It's like, wow, well, you know, it's there are also other outlets there. And so we we came uh, across like f five different categories we could could find. But then also discussion arose. It's like, well, um, it's not just sometimes the data that are the problem. It's the specific situation uh, that a researcher is in, as I said, the traveling researcher or the ones that, that has no funds. And so there could be uh, several reasons and scenarios uh, why it is hard for researchers to publish uh, their data on top of being maybe hard, hard to publish data because they're reporting negative data. And uh, we wanted to show them ways out. And the, what was the, the, the underlying uh, theme was uh, we wanted to, to empower researchers here because we, it's not about just getting the data out. We want researchers to, to receive recognition and credit for their work. So everybody is sort of like nobody goes out there and produces data that are hard to publish. Everybody uh, is sort of trying really hard to uh, uh, to uh, uh, produce a nice data set. And just sometimes it doesn't work out or you have to move on or other reasons exist. But you have put in work uh, that has merit. So get credit for what you've done. And uh, um, the last piece of the puzzle was to to get something that is a catchy acronym. And so we uh, came up with uh, or we agreed on, on on FIDDLE, which stands for File Draw Data Liberation Effort. So uh, the, the outlets for data that, that we present in FIDDLE are uh, data sets, uh, uh, micro publications, uh, preprints, pure data journals, uh, publishing platforms, and journals that are open to uh, what we call null results. And uh, um, we also want to put in, not, oh, these were the main categories, but uh, uh, we want to put in also criteria for importance. So uh, um, are there funds there sort of like to, to for, for publication? So can you pay APCs? Uh, what uh, outcome indexing do you prefer? Do you want your study to be peer, peer, peer reviewed? And it's really time of the essence so that your data need to appear really fast or can you uh, wait and maybe for a, a longer peer review uh, process? And um, we put all these sort of like then in, uh, uh, we found out about these, these outlets, what properties they have and uh, displayed them there uh, in options. 
the other tab that we then had was scenarios. And uh, these are the stories why uh, data are in the file drawer. And um, so these are the um, 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 ideas that we came up with as a group. So uh, it's usually it's time and an incomplete data set, uh, the nature of sort of like of the study. Uh, um, it could be also that uh, you have data, for instance, that, that you're not be able to analyze because you, you moved on and you don't have specific software anymore or you don't have the knowledge uh, or the time. And um, again, uh, excitability we put in there or I don't have anyone to, to pay for open access charges. What can I do? And um, so, um, and, and then I think this, these, these, these two uh, sides really sort of like help you to uh, also expand your horizon a little bit, how uh, um, the problem of, of unpublishable data can be viewed, you know, because it's, uh, it can be a, a part of the, the story for um, um, uh, the, the properties of the data set, but also really uh, it could be just your your situation. And so depending on this, you can also set a scenario and see it's like what results are displayed here, or uh, then also switch to, to options, sort of like what would I like to have? And um, at an earlier version, we, we I, some people said like, let's drop the scenarios. Uh, just focus on this. And I think a majority of people said like, no, we should have both in there. And, and I think that makes it uh, uh, appealing. Again, the, the, the criteria are listed here that we then uh, put in. And that was also part of the, 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 the peer review helped a lot with this because uh, before we had no indexing in there and uh, it was it was good. And I think it was Tim Arrington actually that reviewed this and, and, and brought up this aspect in there uh, and uh, we also uh, again we, we draw from uh, um, other uh, data sets here from and put in the publication costs in in, in in euro and in dollar and also the reported time uh, of publication so it's uh, uh, we, we look these up and uh, um, um, for a few samples and um, yeah let me just show you now how it actually works and give you a see and feel. Okay, where are we at here? Okay, so let's reload this. Okay. Okay, so uh, we are here in, in, in at Fiddle at the, the options panel. Um, and let's say we have a, a results from yeah, um, a full scale study. Um, the money for to cover publication cost is maybe up to thousand euro, and I want this to be indexed at least in PubMed, and um, yeah, um, and um, yeah, maybe I want this to be peer reviewed, and um, I don't really care if it's uh, immediately or later because I have the time. And you see, for instance, then uh, uh, Fiddle selects for you as a best option uh, the publishing uh, platforms such as, as Open Research Central or uh, F1000 Research and others. So again, if, if you change things here, uh, um, let's say uh, you say, uh, um, I have a rejected manus uh, or manuscript and uh, I have uh, more money for instance, uh, to cover publication costs, then you are, have also the option to publish in, in, in traditional uh, journals that support null results. Um, quick story here, you see uh, journals open to null results with an asterisk. Um, so uh, we once we released Fiddle, we had lots of journals contacting us. It's like we want to be added to this because we also publish null results. and. Um, uh, we, uh, at least, I mean, initially we were happy for the attention, but with time we had to realize we have to come up with, with more solid criteria. And this is what we specified here. Uh, so either the, the aim of the scope or editorial criteria or guidance for all the section on the website must explicitly state 
uh, that the journal welcomes and accepts manuscripts containing negative, null, or inconclusive results. And uh, only then is really, uh, um, we will post this there. Um, and it would be best if this was also part of the um, instructions for uh, reviewers, because um, this is also a field where it really falls off. Uh, um, they need to follow these, these practices, the same is true for, for editors. Okay, and so we, we left uh, with, with, with these uh, 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 journals here, and we haven't been contacted uh, since. Okay, so um, now let's go to scenarios again. Um, and uh, with scenarios, um, we have sort of like uh, my data set or set is incomplete. Uh, then, for instance, uh, we suggest data repositories or micro publications. Um, um, if you uh, say something needs to be published quickly, uh, again, the, the preprint publication or uh, all options are chosen where you sort of like see in immediate uh, 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 results here. Okay, again, some of these uh, choices are debatable because there are some research platforms where also re your research appears immediately. So um, again, uh, um, sometimes people say it's like, well, if I like this and this and this, so I actually get to different results or sometimes no result comes up. Um, um, yeah, this, this can happen. But again, we cannot really uh, assume for all kinds of possibilities or all kinds of uh, um, um, out, sub outlets that, that that exist in in this. So, but we we try. It's it's a it's a tool that creates also a certain awareness, and uh, and I think uh, that was the, the the aim of it to 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 for researchers to keep an open mind and not sort of like just run into one journal desk rejection after another and showing hey there are different ways to think about this. Um, the same is true sort of like with the effort. It can be what is low, what is medium, it's all debatable. But um, yeah, so that is uh, fiddle how it works. Okay, back to the presentation. Um, so which brings me to, to one of the most important points. Uh, um, and this is what makes data really valuable. Um, and uh, because we get this question a lot, uh, uh, why do you need to publish uh, negative data? These 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 are not uh, these are without value. One and when does a study become uh, of value? And it has to do really with the the reporting, and the reporting of of the data and study design. So, um, your research question needs to be really clearly stated. What what did you try to do? What was your study? Uh, uh, um, entail to to investigate and uh, a, sta a clear statement needs to be there and not somewhere hidden or not told um, if it contains subjects participants and specimens or samples you should tell who uh, was your study uh, subjects uh, um, how did you obtain uh, samples if you got approval or consent so uh, be be concise so that it's in, in transparent in this uh, manner a study design, it's important to explain whether your study was exploratory or confirmatory and assess really the, report, uh, um, the reported risks of, of, of bias uh, because uh, um, that is really important to, uh, um, to show that, uh, um, yeah, whether you consider risk of bias and how you, how you addressed it. Um, same is true for sample size, justification, whether you included uh, or excluded criteria uh, uh, and uh, whether you're presented also flow charts um, of attrition, for instance, when you uh, lost uh, um, participants or study subjects, where at one point did this happen in, in the study. The data should be enriched with metadata. Uh, published according fair principles and uh, in uh, suitable repositories. Result really report what was measured, the sample size for each group and analysis. Uh, um, and the analysis should be transparent, include code uh, if available, and enough description for reproduction. Uh, the limitations 
every study should have a small limitations section because uh, it's necessary to uh, to uh, to show basically where uh, your study applies and where it doesn't apply anymore. Also, uh, especially when your study is small and underpowered, so that uh, the evaluation can see in in that light. And um, a contact person should be uh, also in there. That uh, uh, sometimes it's the corresponding author, but um, it doesn't hurt if there's like also a generic email address or a second person that can be contacted afterwards uh, regarding uh, eventual data. And when you do all these, uh, please consider uh, uh, reporting guidelines um, as you find it in the equator network. Uh, look for the ones that apply to your specific study. So this brings me to the last point of, of FIDDLE because I also thought that, that it could serve a, a, another point that's important for early career researchers. And we all know that we do lab rotations and internships and sometimes also undergraduate biomedical research classes um, in which, um, yeah, small data sets are produced uh, by, um, yeah, undergrads that are really excited that could be one of their first uh, studies that they do under supervision of, of graduate student or, or PI. And, uh, um, and then at the end of the rotation, usually uh, people say it's like, hmm, yeah, this, we'll see about these data. They, they may help sort of like us publish a paper. And if we get there, we will let you know. And um, that's where it leaves off sometimes. And, um, and this is sort of sometimes unfair because you never know what's happening, where these data are used, where they never used for anything else, but you actually did some work uh, on your own. And again, the problem is you have nothing to show except for that you completed a class and you do not get credit. And depending how large your data set is, uh, it could be, you know, just a data repository. It could be a micro publication. Uh, um, and, um, um, and then I think it's something to consider and to help sort of early career researchers in that manner to also, uh, teaches you the, teach them the importance of, of data ownership and what is really needed to turn data into a publication. And, uh, in that sense, I, I think, uh, um, considering a, a fiddle as, 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 as a way sort of like where could data end up. Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting concept that is, I think is both fair to the data producer and also to the principal in investigator. And it doesn't hurt any principal investigator to say that, uh, some data that were used for a bigger study actually came from a repository um, uh, um, entry that an, an undergraduate uh, um, researcher produced. So, and yeah, with this, I am at the end of the talk for today. And um, yeah, um, you can read more about Fiddle again in this publication from 2020. Um, and again, uh, if you want to play around with it, here's the URL again. And now I'm happy to answer uh, questions. We are actually going to bring Renee into the panel here for the Q&A round. Uh, but before we do that, I'll just thank everyone um, for, for the kind attention. And we'll actually stop the recording so that we can have a more fruitful discussion.